Okay, uh, let's continue with our discussion of the labor theory of value. Labor theory of value has a very simple claim. The labor value of any commodity is equal to the amount of labor time congealed or installed in the commodity. Labor time, you know, we can distinguish in this respect between direct labor and direct labor is the quantity of labor that is used in the production of the commodity. And also indirect labor, we can talk about indirect labor. Uh, sometimes it's called dead labor. And the first one is sometimes called living labor, you know, living labor, living person, human beings. And on the other hand, we have this indirect labor. And uh, let's call it LL. Living labor, and this is LD, dead labor. I'm just Okay, so the total value, of course, labor value, which means labor time, because the measure of labor is time, basically. So labor value equal for any commodity, for any commodity today, is equal to the sum of living labor plus dead labor. This is in the first period. But we also know by this logic that what we call dead labor is equal, again, the living labor plus dead labor in the second period minus two, let's say. Previous period because uh, labor theory of value applies to any commodity, including the capital goods and services, capital goods in general. So, if you want to produce a particular capital commodity or particular input or any commodity, we need to use both capital and labor, right? And but within capital itself, labor time is also congealed. So, we have to consider this as well. So this is, let's use this. Uh, this is the first period. This is the second period. And this is the second period. This is the third period, even previous. We go back in time. Uh, again, that labor and living labor, right? Minus, etc. So this is the direct labor, LL in the that is used in the production of a particular commodity this is the dead labor and this dead labor equal to let's use this this is better like this uh, and this is second uh, the dead labor and living labor that is used previously to produce capital goods so maybe graphically speaking something like this you know this is the total time labor time that is used to produce a particular commodity, wheat, let's say, doesn't matter. And part of it is living labor, dead labor. Dead labor being capital, right? But we also know that this particular part of capital is used again when technology is given, because technology is the basic component of the labor productivity in general. This is again, uh, living labor, direct labor, and that labor. And this that labor part is again the sum of living labor and wind. And therefore, so this goes to infinity when the dead labor becomes zero, basically. Right? So this is the first period. This is a previous period. What we have to do is that we should sum these direct labors that are congealed within the commodities that are used in the production process, right? This is the basic idea. So labor theory value actually argues that the value of any commodity is equal to 
the sum of total label values or label time that is equal, uh, that is congealed. Uh, on that's a very interesting word. Sometimes these terms, sometimes crystallized. Fancy words, right? Uh, which means total quantity of labor that is used in the production process for any production. So basically, labor theory uh, value argues that we need to add up these particular living labors that are stored within the commodity produced and also within the other commodities that are used uh, to produce these uh, commodities that is used as input in the commodity in question. Yeah, it's not true, but anyway, something like that. So this is this formulation. Uh, let me see. Where was that? Let's see. Sorry. Where are you? Technology isn't my thing. Anyway, just forget it. Uh, total amount of value uh, is to be determined by the, uh, I'm sorry, total value of any commodity is to be determined by the labor time, both direct labor and indirect labor. Okay, so here, of course, we have one very interesting and difficult question. A difficult problem to solve, uh, which is sometimes called as the transformation problem, which means uh, this. Again, let me use this iPad or whatever. Oops. Where have you been? Ah, okay. I hope you see it, right? We have two different sets of prices. Prices of production on the one hand and values. Values usually exchange value, but Marx also uh, used this. Remember in Adam Smith, we have this distinction between use value and exchange value. Use value refers to utility, basically, and exchange value refers to labor values, uh, especially Ricardo. Price of production is simply uh, this. Price is equal to uh, cost plus profit margin. And this profit is equal to uh, basically Mm. R times profit rate. This is profit margin. This is profit rate. Rate of profit, right? Rate of profit times cost. Therefore, so price of production, of course, we talk about cost plus R times cost, which is equal to cost times one plus R, right? So that's the basic idea. So this is the price of production we are talking about, right? But on the other hand, we have values. Values are labor values, right? Labor values is the amount of direct labor one, two, three, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, right? Labor, uh, total amount of labor used, uh, labor values or labor time. Okay, so the transformation problem is simply. Okay, cost of production and the thing. For example, in Marx, 
there are three components of price, price, constant capital, the amount of capital goods. Constant capital refers to that label, right? Living labor, variable capital. So total capital is equal to C plus, I'm sorry, using, yeah, this is B. Uh, right? So therefore, price of production in Marx is equal to C plus W. What is this? Cost of production. Plus profit. Profit margin again is the same, right? C plus B times R profit rate times C plus V, right? So this is the cost, this is the profit, right? And from this, we can say that one plus R times C plus V, right? And this profit in marks is equal to what he calls surplus value. Which is called uh, S. It is shown by this, actually. So, on the basis of this, we can say that uh, one plus R price is equal to C plus S. This is the general formulation, and this is a particular price of production, right? But here, the tricky part is that. All variables here, constant variable, uh, I'm sorry, constant capital, variable capital, and surplus value are all expressed in value terms, in terms of labor time. You know, this is the labor time that is used as numera, basically, the measure of that. Okay, on the other hand, we have this I'm sorry, particular problem of the transition from Values to prices, values, labor time. Prices are again, they are expressed in terms of labor time, but they are different uh, from labor time, conceptually speaking, of course. These are prices, right? Prices of production, cost prices, we are talking about. So basically, how can we switch from or transform values? into prices. Transformation problem is this. On the one hand, we have uh, think that values is, let's use this as value equation, W for value, or W is for, usually for wage, but in this formulation, V refers to variable capital. So in order to avoid confusion, V is this W thing, C plus V plus S. So for this again, we have to, uh, I'm sorry, change it. Anyway, and on the other hand, we have price equation, one plus R, C plus W plus plus C plus one, three, right? So from this constant capital in terms of uh, labor values, of course, uh, used as a measure of value and variable capital. So from this, we can see that uh, S must be identical to uh, I'm sorry, this is not this. R, okay. Uh, R times C plus V. And from this, we can see that R is equal to S over C plus V. S is surplus value. 
C plus R total fractal. So basically, profit rate is by definition, of course, equal to the ratio of total amount of profit divided by the total quantity of capital, which is equal to this. Okay, the returning to this transformation problem, uh, we have this problem. Okay, there's no uh, problem of transforming uh, of constant capital and variable capital into its counterparts. Uh, but here we have this problem of uh, transforming values into prices. Why do we have such a problem? Uh, it starts again with Evan Smith. Here, the problem is this. Profit rate is equal, sorry, among sectors of the economy, uniform, profit rate, right? On the one hand. On the other hand, profit, profit rate being uh, uniform simply means that the quantity of profit that is created by the quantity of capital in each sector is exactly the same in the long run. You know, the, the price of production is a long run, utility price or natural price. Uh, so basically, uh, it occurs only in the long run when the equilibrium is reached. And we have these centers of gravity, basically. This is the basic idea. Uh, so in the long run, we have the situation that in each sector of the economy, total quantity of profit created by the quantity of capital used in this particular uh, sector is equal among sectors. For one unit of capital, each sector will get exactly the same quantity of profit. This is because of competition, free competition. But if in each sector of the economy, the capital labor ratio in today's economists jargon, which is C O D in Marx, are equal, there is no such problem of transforming values into prices. Because what does it means to say that uh, capital labor ratio is equal in every sector of the economy. The quantity of labor per unit of capital is equal in every sector of the economy. So there's no complication in this transformation of values into prices. But if, as we know actually, as an empirical observation, in each sector, the quantity, uh, one unit of the ratio of labor to capital or capital to labor, doesn't matter, or the ratio of constant capital to value to capital uh, is not equal in each sector. There are capital intensive sectors, right? Also there are labor intensive sectors. The, the, uh, Capital labor ratio in the production of computers, of course, is greater than the capital labor ratio in the production of porn, for example, right? We can say that. So if this is the case, we have this problem again. Uh, we know that uniform rate profit, in order for the uniform rate uh, profit, uh, from a technical point of view, of course, we may need to have the uniformity of capital labor ratios, in which case there's no such problem. But as an empirical observation, we know that uh, the value, of course we are talking about here, the value of capital labor ratio uh, in each sector is not the same. They are different. So it means that uh, in some sectors, in some capital intensive sectors, for example, uh, the profit rate may be different from uh, the profit rate that could correspond to the uh, capital labor ratio. 
What I'm saying is simply that we expect a higher rate of profit in capital intensive sectors, whereas uh, a lower profit rate in the labor intensive sectors. This is a particularly important and difficult problem to solve. What I'm saying is actually it's, it's getting more complicated, but maybe I should stop explaining uh, through the... Okay, returning to this. Let's see. Did I say I have technology? Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, here. Last time, this is the relationship between prices and values. Of course, uh, we also said that uh, price of production depends on three sets of variables, uh, label values, uh, matrix A and technology matrix and the distributive shares. Here, this is a general equation for the whole of the economy. So it doesn't show us the differences uh, among different sectors of the economy. We simply assume that here R is the uniform, R is the uniform in each sector of the economy. So that in, the, in this case, we can uh, have this general expression. But if capital labor ratio or the ratio of constant variable to variable capital, constant, the ratio of constant capital to variable capital is different as we expect in each sector of the economy, then we may have this problem of transformation. This again, particular uh, equation, this whole thing cannot show this complexity complexity that is created by the inequality of the uh, labor capital ratios in each sector or the ratios of constant capital to variable capital. Okay, anyway, so this, this is an important point. We are going to uh, return to this uh, issue. And let me see. Uh, but maybe we can use another representation. In Marx just leaving the subject of the transformation here. Okay, th this, this representation, let me see. Uh, stop that share and share a new one. Okay, this, can you see it? Okay, this is from E.K. Hunt's book, E.K. Hunt and his co-writer, Mark Lautz and Heiser, I guess. Uh, history of economic thought. And this is the same I have written. Okay, total value is equal to dead labor and living labor and surplus labor. He uses this or they use this notation. Uh, here I, I used LL, but this is LN. And S refers to surplus, so surplus labor is equal to uh, the surplus value, basically. And these are the things, and this is the profit rate of them, right? Basically, and you can read it here. Okay, from this, you can see that the general formulation in Okay, price of production is equal to cost of commodities used in production, constant capital, cost of labor used in production, variable capital, and profit markup, surplus capital. Uh, surplus value, actually, it's cost of commodities, constant capital, bad labor, variable capital, living labor, et 
itself. So we have this particular relationship. But here lies the essence of the transformation problem, basically. How can you transform values into commodities? You can do this when, again, you have the equality of capital labor or constant capital to uh, variable capital at those sectors. But if these ratios of constant capital to variable capital are different in each sector, there will be some complications uh, that uh, create some problems. Marx knew about this, of course, before Marx, Ricardo also said that. He said basically, uh, you know, the market solves this problem. Why is this important? If the constant uh, capital to variable capital ratios are different, it means that for one unit of labor uh, of, you know, the quantity of capital that is used are different in the sector. So if this is the case, why should we have the uniformity of profit rate? Because in a capital intensive sector, we expect a higher profit rate to occur. And the solution to this problem, according to Ricardo, Ricardo was aware of this and he tried to solve it. Uh, he, he was not successful. And in the end, he said that, you know, we can make an assumption that we can use gold, for example, the measure of value. If we assume that the quantity of, uh, I'm sorry, the ratio of capital to labor, uh, it's easier to put it in this way. The ratio of capital to uh, capital labor ratio uh, in the production of gold is equal to the average capital ratio uh, labor ratio in the economy. Then we can uh, use this. Uh, gold as a measure of value. Ricardo was aware that gold is not invariant to the changes in distributive shares, because if there's any change in one of the distributive categories uh, in the production of gold, the value of gold itself will also change. But still he believes in the labor theory of value. And he tries to solve this by developing a principle and this principle is this. Uh, he says basically that there will be the, the market will automatically adjust these changes so that there will be a transfer from a lower capital intensity sector to a higher capital intensity sector in terms of profit, of course. So that on the average, the total uh, capital labor ratio, uh, average capital labor ratio will be reached and therefore the values will correspond to prices, etc. etc. So this transfer of value is also used by Marx and Marx was tried to show it uh, in, in, in the third volume of capital basically. And you can see this uh, from E.K. Hunt's book. Uh, you can read it, uh, maybe next week we can talk about it, but today just we are making an introduction. The point is that this is an important problem and important criticism directed to the labor theory of value. Again, labor theory of value means two things sometimes. One is the measure of value, which is a technical problem, as we said, right? And the other is, uh, it's a metaphysical problem, if you will. Metaphysical in the sense that uh, we are talking about here the source of value rather than measure of value. The source of value means that value is created by labor, which begs the question actually, why labor? Why not steel? Why not capital? Why not machine? Why not even peanuts, right? So the answer lies, of course, the metaphysical part of the theory, you know, human beings are capable of creating some surplus value, a value which is greater than its own value. 
here, by the way, we had to uh, stress the assumption that Marx makes, makes. The value of labor is also determined by uh, the amount of labor time in the reproduction of labor. What's the meaning of the reproduction of labor? You know, uh, what we call today uh, leisure actually is a period in which we actually renew our productive capacities, basically. You know, we get rest, uh, we try to deal with some uh, pleasurable activities, etc. right? Watching TV, uh, creating a sculpture, whatever you are capable of doing. So basically, uh, labor time, the cost of labor, I'm sorry, the value of labor is also determined by the amount of labor time crystallized or congealed within labor itself. This is this is the implication of labor theory of value. For any commodity, including labor uh, power itself, is to be determined by the total quantity of labor, labor time, uh, that is required to produce or reproduce this particular commodity. You know, we are not actually talking about the production of labor power, but the production of labor power, because labor power is a part and parcel of being human, right? We are human beings, we have this power of making a difference, power of agency, etc. This is labor time, I mean, labor power, right? So according to Mars, capitalism is characterized by the fact that labor time, labor power itself becomes a commodity. And like any commodity, its own uh, value will be determined by the amount of labor time that is required to reproduce this particular power, labor power. And of course, this is the implication of labor theory of value, but Marx also assumes that wages are equal to labor values. Capitalist pays the uh, exactly the wages equal to the labor value of labor power, basically. Which means that basically, you know, uh, the, the wage is not less than, for example, the value of labor, which could be the case, actually, uh, in later volumes in the third volume, I guess, of capital. Marx also says that, uh, you know, usually capitalists uh, will pay less than the value of labor time, in which case we have this, what he calls alienation profit uh, in the theory of surplus value in his book, basically. But throughout capital, he assumes that the quantity of wages uh, are exactly equal to the value of labor time. So, which means actually what we call, what he calls exploitation uh, is not caused by some kind of underpayment. It is caused by the capacity of labor power to produce a value which is greater than its own value, which is called surplus value. Surplus value is the difference between the total uh, amount of value created by labor and the cost of labor, which is profit actually, right? So labor is capable of producing some extra value, some surplus value that is greater than its own value. And this extra, this surplus value is to be expropriated by the capitalists in terms of profit. That's the basic idea. So labor theory of value also argues that the source of value is labor. But of course, uh, if we don't have this one-to-one -one correspondence between surplus and uh, profit, which is the essence of the transformation problem, actually, the transformation of values into prices, right? 
So prices uh, are about costs and profit. That is about the labor time created by labor, etc. Direct labor and direct labor, of course. So basically, uh, when the capital labor ratio differs across sectors, this correspondence will be broken. In which case, the labor theory of value should also be capable of explaining in what direction and in what magnitude prices will differ from values. We know that because of the existence of uh, the differences among capital labor ratios across sectors, we, we do not have one-to-one -one correspondence between prices and values. Prices will differ somehow and somewhat from the values. But if we are able to show in what direction and in what magnitude uh, these differences in prices will occur, then again, we can defend the theory. That's the essence of the transformation problem, but transformation problem can be solved in the sense. You can show that. Prices will differ in this direction from the values and in these quantities. Then it's okay, everything is okay. Ricardo did not show this, but he developed this particular principle that uh, the prices will be higher in the sectors that will have greater capital labor ratios, greater capital intensity. And prices will be lower in the sectors which has lower capital labor ratios. Uh, this, he says, a general principle, and this occur automatically within a market economy. Why? We don't know. He does not explain. Marx tried to explain this, and he tried to show in what ways and in what quantities that these uh, prices will differ from the values. But his solution was flawed mathematically, arithmetically, actually. Uh, he transformed outputs but did not transform inputs. That was his problem. And since then, Marxists tried to solve this problem of transformation by using the prices. There are a number of solutions to the transformation problem. I'm not sure if it could be seven or eight. Uh, you know, you can solve it. Uh, mathematically, but you have to make some assumptions, assumptions which we are talking about uh, in the next week, I guess. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that uh, two things actually. One, it is not a great deal in my mind, you know, whether we have a good solution or not. And second, uh, you may come up with a solution, as I said, uh, on the basis of different assumptions, but these assumptions could be judged against the general methodology and analytical structure of Marxists. Uh, you know, some people argue that, for example, you can solve this problem if you assume that uh, the constraints that are brought by Marx. Uh, could be changed uh, I don't want to go into detail this uh, in this particular session next week maybe we can start with this distinction I guess it's better to stop here uh, because it's getting complicated and we don't have unfortunately enough time to do so see you next week thank you